Good afternoon and welcome to the National Center for Rural Road Safety's October webinar entitled Rural Road Departures Part 1. This is part one of a three-part series. Um, we're going to get started now. I'm going to close out these polls that you guys have been filling out and give you a little bit of information about them. It does look like we have about 28% of you from local DOTs, about 20% from state DOT, about 15% from federal DOT. We have about 5% of you from tri tribal governments, about 2.5% from public lands agencies, and about 2.5% from other federal, state, or local government agency. Um, also about 7 to 8% of you from educational institutions, um, about 13% of you private consultants, and then we have about 5% of you from, from other. Um, most of you are joining us from uh, your computers all by yourself, about 80% of you, but as always, we do have a large number of you joining us in conference rooms as well. So I will give you a little bit more information here in a second on how to get those uh, that information to us and everybody registered so that we can provide you with the certificates and CEUs that you may be wanting. Uh, where you're joining us from today, it looks like we have about 44% of you from the western U.S., about 24% from the Midwest, 11% from the Southeast, 13% from the Northeast, and about 6.5% of you from somewhere else other than those ones. And most of you are joining us by computer only, about 83%. So I would remind you um, that if you do have any audio connection issues today, that we would ask you to also call in. Um, sometimes the internet connection makes the audio spotty. Um, so if you do have that issue, again, the phone number is in the top left-hand corner of your screen. It is an 866 number. Um, you may also chat with the host, the WTI staff members up at the top, a private chat, and they can also try and assist you if you are having any audio issues today. I'm going to move us over to our presentation and provide you with a little bit more information. So for today's logistics, uh, we will, this will run about an hour and a half, and as with all of our webinars, we are recording this. So for quality of our recording, we have put everyone on mute. Um, if you are listening to us by phone, we would ask that you mute your computer screen, um, your computer sound, otherwise you may have some feedback. Uh, because you are muted and not able to ask questions of our speakers um, through the phone, we would ask that you put those in the chat pod, which you can find on the left-hand side. You can go ahead and put your questions in there at any time. When we do stop for a question and answer period, I will read those out to our presenters. So again, go ahead and put those at any time that you'd like. There's also a handout pod at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, and there you will find both a PDF version of today's um, slides, in case you would like those as a handout, and we also do have a rural roadway fact sheet that is from the EDC-5 program, um, and Dick Albin, our speaker, will be speaking about that later. So again, both of those are available in the bottom left-hand corner. Also, for those of you who are um, joining us in groups today, if you wouldn't mind sending us a list of names and email addresses for everyone who is in your group to our email at info, I-N-F-O, at ruralsafetycenter.org. Uh, that will allow us to send you a survey. We will have two surveys coming out following today's webinar. The first one will be directly after, and it will provide you the opportunity to check at the end of it whether or not you would like a certificate of completion and or CEUs for today's webinar. Again, this is the only way to request certificates of education um, and certificates of completion and CEUs. That survey will take you just five to ten minutes to fill out. It's mostly about how the, how the information was presented today. Um, in about three months, we will also send you a follow-up email, and that survey will ask you more questions about what you did with the information from today. Perhaps you went and looked up more information about the EDC-5 innovation. Uh, perhaps you were able to implement some of the countermeasures that you found today. That's the type of information we're looking for from that second survey. So here I'm 
providing you with the survey link for the for today's um, survey. Again, it will come out to you in email directly following today's webinar, but we have found that in some cases it ends up in your junk box. Um, so if you're not able to find it, we do provide the link today as well, right now. Um, it is also available in that handout on the bottom left-hand corner as well in case you need to find it afterwards. The survey closes two weeks after the webinar, and you can expect your certificates and CEU forms about three to four weeks afterwards as we do have to manually create those and email them to everyone. The CEU forms, once you've filled those out, can be returned to continuing ed at montana.edu and not to the Safety Center. Uh, that is handled by a different department out of Montana State University. Um, and those CEUs are provided to you for free. You can also request a verification of completion form to see, to see which um, of the CEUs you have received. Uh, on your screen now, in the top left-hand corner, you should see the course registration form that we'll email you for you to send out. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you would see the verification of completion form. Um, this will provide you with how many CEUs and which of our webinars you have requested them for. Today's webinar is being co-hosted by several people. Along with the Safety Center, it is being co-hosted by the Federal Highway Administration and the Everyday Counts Program. It's also being co-hosted by the National Association of County Engineers and their Safety Committee, and also from the National LTAP and TTAP Association as well and their Safety Committee. Today's presenters, we are lucky enough to have Dick Albin from FHWA and Keith Knapp from the Iowa LTAP. Dick joined FHWA as a safety engineer with the FHWA Resource Center's safety and design team in June of 2008. Prior to joining FHWA, he worked for 15 years with the Washington State Department of Transportation and was an assistant state design engineer when he left. Dick also worked for six years for the New York State Department of Transportation in a regional office. He graduated from the University of Wyoming with a BS in Civil Engineering and is a licensed professional engineer in Washington State. He is also a certified NHI instructor. Keith Knapp is the director of the Iowa Local Technical Assistance Program at the Institute for Transportation in Trans at Iowa State University. He is also a member of our Safety Center team. He has more than 25 years of experience in transportation-related training, outreach and extension, and research. He has developed and been an instructor in local, state, and national training courses with a wide range of subjects and has taught traffic engineering, safety, and highway design at various universities. He is a registered professional engineer as well. So we'd like to thank both of them for taking the time today to present. For the goals of our webinar, once you have completed this webinar, you will have a summary of the rural roadway departure safety problem, a description of the EDC-5, A uh, description of the EDC-5 innovation focused on rural roadway departure reduction and a discussion about rumble strips, uh, which is one of the proven safety countermeasures. And I'm going to pause for one second. Dana, it looks like our PowerPoint may have gone away. Could you please take care of that? Um, our learning outcomes for today's webinar, while well, Dana's pulling back up our PowerPoint presentation, are to summarize the safety problem connected to rural roadway departures, to describe approaches to reduce rural roadway departures, to identify proven safety countermeasures to combat rural roadway departures, to list who to speak with in your state to show your support for joining EDC-5 innovation, to describe the potential safety-related benefits of rumble strips and rumble stripes, and to identify some of the issues to consider before implementation. And now I do want to check and make sure. Um, Dick, are you able to see our, our PowerPoint at this time? No, I'm not. I'm actually uh, trying to figure out what's going on because I got a big black screen uh, where it says that I'm. It says stop sharing, but I'm not really sharing. But uh, all I have is a black screen on mine. Jamie, what are you seeing? Um, I do see the PowerPoint at this time. Okay. And it, it appears like Keith may be as well at this time. Yeah. Yeah, and for some reason I'm I'm just not seeing it. Uh, so I'm not sure how you want to proceed if you want me to try to go off and have you advance or, or I'm not even sure if I can advance. Uh, I can try uh, if you like, but I'm not seeing sure, what's uh, 
Nope, that's fine. I can go ahead and, and advance it for you if you would like to talk off the PowerPoint backup that we gave you. Okay, so I'll talk off of that. Okay. So tell me what slide number you're on. Um, I'm on your What is Every Day Count slide, your very first one. Okay. All right. So, so sorry, uh, whatever this glitch is, I've not seen this one before. So uh, um, I'm going to uh, continue on uh, with uh, What is Every Day Counts. And um, the um, Every Day Counts is a state-based model. Uh, and what we're trying to do with it is to identify and rapidly deploy proven yet underutilized innovations uh, with the intent of trying to shorten the project delivery process, enhance roadway safety, reduce congestion, or improve environmental sustainability. Uh, EDC is done in uh, two-year cycles. Uh, we're actually going into our fifth round now with 10 new innovations that we're going to be promoting over the next couple of years. Uh, and I am going to be speaking about uh, one of those. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. Uh, and the innovation or the initiative that I'm going to be talking about is reducing rural roadway departures. So it fits very nicely with the National Center for Rural Road Safety. Um, and our mission is to reduce the potential for serious injury and fatal roadway departure crashes on all public roads by increasing the by increasing the systemic deployment of proven countermeasures. And in this presentation, I'm going to cover the why, how, and what. And if you could advance the slide for me. And so first off, the why is about a third of all fa traffic fatalities happen on rural roads. Go ahead and advance. Okay. See, and I'm not sure, again, I can't see what's uh, being shown here. But um, so do you see the red circle? Yep, we do. OK. I was getting a, a seeing the screen for a second. Uh, on somebody, somebody else was showing it to me, but now I'm not. So um, anyway, so about uh, right now, uh, over uh, 35,000 people get killed on our highways every year. Um, and go ahead and advance. About half of those are occurring on a rural road. Um, uh, and go ahead and advance again. And of those, about 34% of all fatalities are some type of rural roadway departure. So a roadway departure, uh, and you may use the term lane departure, uh, and we're saying about the same thing. Uh, but the way Federal Highways defines a roadway departure is a crash in which a vehicle crosses an edge line, a center line, or otherwise leaves the traveled way. And that could include a vehicle that runs off the road and hits a fixed object or rolls over. Or it could also include a vehicle that crosses a center line and is involved with a head-on impact, uh, as you see in the picture uh, here. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. And, and this slide is showing uh, the, the states around the country uh, and what percentage of rural roadway departures are uh, as a portion of all their fatalities in their state. And you can see some states have a much higher percentage of uh, roadway departures. Uh, they tend to be the more rural states. So that makes sense because we're talking rural roadway departures. Uh, but even states that you see maybe on the lower end, like uh, uh, Florida and California, if you advance to the next slide, you can see that they also have very large numbers of fatalities in, for rural roadway departures. So we think that there's something in this for everybody. Uh, even if that isn't as big of a proportion in your state, uh, you might have a large number of, of uh, people that get killed uh, in a rural roadway departure crash. Um, and the, uh, when, when we talk, if you advance uh, to the why all public roads, um, when we look at uh, where fatalities are happening, um, we, uh, we don't really know the ownership uh, of roads. We don't have a database that uh, indicates who owns roads. And every state is a little bit different. Some states maintain more of the roadway miles uh, as, at the state agency. Uh, and uh, other states have a lot of local agencies that maintain the, uh, the, the, the roads. Um, the, uh, but what we do know is the, the 
functional classification. And the uh, portion over on the right-hand side of the pie chart that are in blue are functional classifications that are typically maintained by, by state agencies, uh, well, whereas the portion on the left that are in green are those that are typically maintained by uh, more like local agencies, uh, local roads, the minor collectors, the major collectors. And you can see that's about 45% of all of the rural roadway departures are, are on those uh, lower uh, functional classifications. And so to be able to, to put a dent into the uh, rural roadway departure uh, numbers, we have to deal uh, and, and we have to address uh, the local uh, and, and collector roads. And if you could go ahead and advance it. Uh, one of the uh, things uh, that's required through the uh, FAST Act is there, there's a uh, requirement for focus on high-risk rural roads and states that seem to have a more uh, higher proportion of, of crashes on rural roads, fatalities on rural roads. Uh, there, there's requirements for them uh, to spend a certain amount of their, their funding uh, to address those types of crashes uh, and, and, and address rural roads. So you can see there are states that uh, already have some incentive to invest in rural road safety, and we think that this initiative will fit in with them very well. So first off, let's talk about why do people leave the road. And uh, this is an opportunity here for, um, for you. Uh, if you could maybe tell us about instances where maybe you ran off the road. Uh, you can chat, put, type it in the chat box. Uh, why did you run off the road first off? Uh, when you ran off the road, what happened? Uh, did, uh, uh, did you recover? Uh, did you hit something? Um, I see a couple of people might be might be typing in here, but but we'd like to get a better idea of what uh, uh, some instance where maybe you uh, were involved with a roadway departure. Uh, I see a wildlife collision there. Uh, so again, a uh, animal may have uh, jumped out in front of you and uh, uh, either caused you to lose control and run off the road, or maybe you tried to avoid the the animal uh, and. Uh, uh, decided to take your chances on the roadside. Uh, hit head on. Tracy was hit head on. Uh, uh, that's a very, uh, um, uh, tends to be a very high severity type of a crash when you're hitting another vehicle coming from the opposite direction. Um, let's see, snow and ice, common Montana. Uh, yes, uh, I, I went to school in Wyoming and I know hitting black ice, uh, you basically have no control anymore. Uh, so uh, you might end up on the roadside. Okay, fell asleep at the wheel. Okay, you're confessing now your sins uh, that you fell asleep at the wheel. Um, and uh, I see our, our lives were saved by an errant camper trailer being able to recover back on the roadway through the use of the safety edge. Okay, so uh, a case where somebody, uh, a, a trailer camper ran off the road, uh, uh, maybe there was an edge drop off and the safety edge helped you get back on the road. Uh, I see narrow or no shoulders. So very good. Um, so just going forward, uh, um, you know, there are different reasons why people leave the roadway. It could be the roadway condition, if you could advance the, uh, the build on this slide to, uh, as I go. Uh, it could be, so the roadway condition could be the uh, sharp curve, or it could be uh, poor friction on your curves, or, or some other thing that having to do with the roadway. Maybe the narrow uh, lane and shoulders. Um, it could have something to do with a vehicle, uh, if you could advance that. Uh, it, you might have a, a blowout of your tire or a failure of uh, some type of the vehicle that causes a crash. Go collect, uh, continue on. Uh, we have uh, collision avoidance. Uh, as you brought up the animal uh, jumping out uh, in front of you, a lot of times people will try to avoid that type of a crash. Or if a vehicle crosses the center line and is in your lane, a natural uh, reaction is going to be to try to avoid that, maybe running off the road. Uh, but the last item that we have, if you could advance that, is driver error. Uh, and uh, what we know is, if you could advance one more, um, is that when we look at the causes of, of crashes, uh, a study that was done back in the 90s found that about 90% of all crashes had some type of driver uh, cause to them, some type of driver error. Uh, about a third of them were related to the roadway. Uh, about uh, a little over 10% had to do with the vehicle. And if you could advance that, 
Uh, and you'll see that the circles come together because there is overlap. You can have driver error at a place where you have a sharp curve, uh, uh, or maybe you have a uh, driver error, you're going too fast, and uh, uh, you have a, uh, a vehicle malfunction. Uh, so they, they can be combined. But, but the key here is that the human is the weakest link. Um, uh, so we must design around the human uh, because humans make errors. If you could advance to the next slide, and we'll get to the how. Um, so, so we t covered the what. About a third of all fatalities have to do with uh, a vehicle running off the road in a rural setting. Uh, the how of this initiative uh, is that we believe that to adequately address these types of crashes, we have to look at it as a systemic analysis. Uh, also, we, we plan on promoting safety, anal uh, safety action plans uh, and looking at deployment of countermeasures based on risk factors. So our, our how, if you could advance, is, is a systemic analysis. And, um, and here's an exercise for you. You can see a map with pin marks on it. Uh, these are fatal crashes that happened uh, in, a, uh, in one location. Uh, uh, and what we're going to look at is a multiple number of years. So if you could advance from, uh, to the next year. And if you look at, when you look at these maps, if you kind of keep an eye on one area of the map and uh, look to see if the, you can see a, a place where you're having um, a concentration of crashes. Uh, uh, so we'll go ahead and advance to the next year and the next until you get to 2016. OK. okay. And, um, and so you probably saw that you didn't really have locations that were uh, coming up repeatedly. And that's one of the problems we have with, uh, with uh, roadway departures is that uh, we, don't have, we generally don't see uh, concentrations of crashes where you can say, OK, if I go out and invest my money and fix this location, I've, I've made a significant improvement in my problem. The, the crashes move around a lot. And that's because, again, they, they are based on human error. And human error can happen anywhere. Now, when we look at the most harmful event in, in crashes, and this is looking at that particular state, statewide totals, uh, we can see for 2012, we had uh, motor vehicle and transport was the number one. And that can include some of our roadway departures, the head-on types of crashes, but it also includes some of the intersection-related crashes. But if we look at the next couple, we have trees and shrubs, uh, rollover crashes, uh, dropping down, we have embankments and ditches, uh, utility poles, traffic barriers. And if you scroll through the, the subsequent years, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, you can see that it's pretty much the same trend year after year. And so what, what that caused us to realize is that fatal crash locations tend to be very random, again, based on human error. And human error can happen anywhere. But the um, going to the next slide, that fatal crash types are very predictable. We know that, that we're going to have the same types of crashes year after year. Um, and go ahead and advance to the next slide. And so that brings us to what we call the systemic safety analysis, or systemic safety improvements. And these are improvements that are widely implemented based on high-risk roadway features that are correlated with a particular severe crash type. And what we're saying there is, rather than trying to chase the crashes that occurred uh, in the past, uh, what we're trying to do is identify what are the high-risk features of that roadway. And then if we can address those features across our system with uh, improvements that are fairly low cost, uh, that that's where we might have our biggest opportunity to make changes. Uh, there are uh, Federal Highways has a systemic safety project selection tool uh, that can be downloaded. Uh, it is uh, it, it talks about identifying what are the risk factors that, that you might want to concentrate on. Now, advance to the next slide. Uh, when we look at our rural roadway departure fatalities, and we look at what is the most harmful event in those fatalities, uh, the types of crashes that make up uh, the majority of them are uh, fall within three categories. There are head-on crashes that make up about 28% of all fatalities, uh, of all roadway departure, rural roadway departure fatalities. Uh, rollover crashes that make up about 30% of rural roadway departure fatalities. And trees. 
Uh, now, there's other fixed objects that make up the rest of the pie, uh, such as barriers and poles. But those three make up over three quarters of all of the fatalities uh, uh, that happen in a rural roadway departure. And when we look at risk factors, uh, if we break those down based on speed, where we're looking at speeds above 50 miles an hour, you can see that rollovers make up about 78 percent of of uh, uh, the, about 78 percent of our rollovers happen where the speed was above 50 miles an hour. 84 percent of the head-ons, uh, 63 percent of the tree crashes uh, happened where the speed was above 50 miles an hour. So speed may be one of those uh, risk factors. Advancing to the next slide, curves. Uh, when we look at our, our different emphasis areas, uh, uh, they also seem to be rep overrepresented. A uh, typical uh, state or agency, generally you don't have uh, um, that big of a percentage of your miles that are on curves. So people tend to like to run off the road on curves more. So we tend to see a big chunk of our rollovers and head-ons and trees happen in curves. So that is another area that you might want to focus in on. Now, one of the tools that we believe uh, should be uh, considered and we're, we plan to, to uh, uh, recommend as part of the EDC initiative is the development of a safety action plan. And the safety action plan um, is kind of a bridge between the strategic highway safety plan that every state has, and just about every state has roadway departure as one of their uh, emphasis areas. Um, and uh, so it's kind of a bridge between the strategic highway safety plan and a uh, funding mechanism like the Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program or other state highway funds or local funds. And the, the action plans can help uh, build awareness of, of safety problems that you might be having. Uh, uh, maybe you didn't, weren't aware of it until you got in to develop your safety action plan. It can help prioritize investments. Uh, in, in the uh, uh, where, you, where you spend the money, and it can really help uh, support grant applications uh, for the uh, 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 to be able to get funding to to fund those projects. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. I'm sorry. Uh, this is the slide on local road safety plans. Uh, so local road safety plans is one of our proven uh, safety countermeasures uh, that that we Federal Highways is. Uh, uh, been promoting, and, and we think that this is a practice that uh, should be considered. Uh, it helps, uh, you know, when you start out identifying who your stakeholders are, using the data that you have available to you, uh, choosing proven countermeasures that we know that work, and then getting those proven countermeasures implemented. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. Uh, one example of a state that has uh, used uh, uh, action plans, local road safety plans, is Washington State. Uh, Washington, uh, they looking at their data, they found that about 70% of their fatal and serious uh, collisions were happening on the county and city uh, 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 systems. So the state provides about 70% of the HSIP funding to those local agencies. They provide safety uh, training, and, and they also provide crash data to those agencies. But then about 33 out of the 39 counties developed a safety plan based on uh, using that data that was provided to them. Uh, and then this has helped them get projects funded using the uh, HSIP funding that was available. Um, it is also noted down there that they found that the crash, the fatal crash rate is about twice as high on the county roads than it were on the state system. So that helped uh, make the case for uh, using the funding uh, on, the, on the local agencies. Now, advancing on to the map that shows the local road safety plans, uh, other states, uh, Minnesota was one of the pioneering states here, uh, North Dakota, Washington, uh, they've developed uh, uh, local road safety plans for the majority of the counties in their states. There's other states like uh, Iowa and Kansas and Louisiana that are working on it. I believe that there's a couple other we can add to this list now. Uh, some states have developed more regional type plans where they're looking at regions of the state, maybe multiple counties, but looking at all the roads. And then there are some individual counties that are participated through a pilot effort. Uh, that's where you see the, the dots on the screen uh, that have developed uh, um, local road safety plans as well. So this, again, is something that we're, we're going to be promoting as part of the Everyday Counts initiative. Um, now, 
going on to the next slide, uh, talking about the data sources, uh, one of the things that might hold some states back is a uh, concern that maybe they don't have good enough data. Uh, maybe they don't have robust crash data or a roadway inventory or know where their traffic volumes, uh, what all the traffic volumes are on the roadways. Um, but they also might have other data that they could use. And a lot of times it might be that you have more data than you think you do. If you tap into sources like your enforcement people, uh, your maintenance uh, folks, also uh, road safety audits. And what we're going to be, one of our taglines uh, with this initiative is, is do what you can with what you have and where you are. Uh, so use the data that you have to come up with a plan that, that, that works for you. Um, you know, there's different types of data. There's uh, quantitative types of data. Uh, where you may have your crash data that you can put into a spreadsheet. Maybe you can identify certain crash types that are overrepresented. Uh, also using crash trees like you see at the bottom. And we understand that you probably can't read those, uh, but we're just giving you examples of, of different types of analysis that can be done with quantitative data. But you also may want to consider using qualitative data in some cases. Maybe you don't know the precise traffic volumes on all your, other, on all your roads. But if you know that there are certain roads that are high volume and others that are low volume, you may want to be focusing more on the higher volume where there's a higher risk. Uh, you may not know the radius of all the curves on your roadway, but you probably have an, a sense for, road, uh, for curves that are fairly sharp and ones that are maybe a little bit flatter. Uh, so quantifying them and saying that they're you know, high volume or low volume or sharp curves or whatnot, that might be one of the factors that you can bring in uh, when you're developing an uh, action plan. Now here's a point where we uh, can uh, uh, ask you some questions and, uh, uh, and uh, ask you to ask any questions that you have. Uh, I've been looking at another screen, so I've got to look back over here for a second. Uh, but also, I think we have some poll questions for you as well. Uh, that you, we do. Uh, okay. We do. And so I'm going to move over to that poll screen and read these out loud. Um, while I'm doing that, I'm going to ask Dick if you wouldn't mind exiting um, the webinar and re-signing back in and see if that could help you be able to see the presentation. I'll do that. This has been a little awkward. So, okay. Yeah. Um, so our poll questions for everyone else. The first one is, which of the following are risk factors that consider for roadway departure? Lane or shoulder width? Traffic volume? speed, curves, all of the above, none of the above, and I believe there's an, I don't know, I don't remember at the bottom there. And then the second poll question is, which of the following is not an effective approach to redu reducing rural roadway departures? Systemic analysis, safety action plan, hotspot analysis, deployment based on risk factors, all of the above, none of the above, or I don't know, I don't remember. And we'll give everyone just a, a few um, seconds to go ahead and fill those out. And again, I do want to remind everyone that chat pod is on the left-hand side. There are a couple of questions over there already, but please feel free to put your questions in that chat pod, and we'll read those out to Dick right after we go through the answers to these poll questions. Okay, I think I can see things again. So. That's great. I'm going to go ahead and end these poll questions for you and display the results. Okay. Are you able to see the results now? Yes, I do. So I see that uh, what risk factors do you think are important for road departure? A couple of people said speed. A couple of people said curves. Uh, a couple of people, 92% said all of the above. Very good. Yeah, you you might you know look at roads that have lane uh, narrow lanes and, and shoulder uh, widths. That might be a higher uh, risk. Uh, definitely higher volumes might be a part of it, speed, uh, curvature. Uh, so uh, yes, many of you identified that that is uh, uh, all, all of those were factors. Uh, which of the following is not an effective approach to reducing rural roadway departures? Um, you know, it looks like one person said systemic analysis, so you're not a believer yet. We're, we're hoping that that maybe can help, help with that at some point in the future. Um, a hotspot analysis. So yeah, again, we don't necessarily have good, uh, a lot of concentration of these types of crashes where they're happening repeatedly in the same location. Um, 
and uh, 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 quite a few of you said none of the above. So none of the above are not effective approaches. Um, again, we think the more effective, uh, rather than uh, responding to crashes that have already happened, is to try to identify where those high risk factors are and go after those. Um, there were a few questions in the poll pod, um, or in the, in the chat pod. Uh, yeah. I see that there was a question, a question about um, uh, roadway design and driver behavior are very intertwined. And, and I'll agree. Uh, a lot of times when, before in the past when we saw that there was driver error on the crash report, we'd say, OK, well, we can't deal with that. But there are things that we can do to help uh, reduce uh, 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 driver error. Um, let's see. i got to see who else had some questions here. Um, yep. So the next question for you is, are crashes in winter a condition of the roadway or a behavioral issue such as speeding? Um, I, I think that they could be both, uh, although I have heard before, I had a state patrolman from Maine uh, say that he thought that people drove slower uh, when there was poor uh, weather conditions like snow. Uh, and he, he promoted having more snow as one of the countermeasures that we might consider. So I don't know if that's necessarily practical, but, uh, um, but uh, so people might drive differently, uh, but definitely uh, you know, having uh, black ice on the roadway it, it can, can lead to uh, roadway departures. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, what is meant by then, motor vehicle and transport? I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to uh, um, So there's a question about what is meant by motor vehicle and transport. That basically means that one vehicle hit another vehicle. And, and I couldn't figure it out through the fire system uh, which ones were uh, head-on crashes versus happen at an intersection where it might be a rear end at an intersection. So I didn't really get too far into that, but there are other crash types, and most of those were in the ro uh, roadway departure um, uh, vein. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a question, can I get a reference to the 2014 to 2016 average annual average of rural so I'm not, that's basically we went to the uh, FARS database and we pulled it out and we uh, uh, did some, uh, you know, we, we you know, kind of isolated the rural roadway departure. So I mean, that's something that Federal Highways has done the, uh, did the analysis for, and we're putting that out in our, uh, in our EDC uh, uh, information. Uh, and then, is there any research on distracted driving specifically? Uh, I think there's been a lot of research uh, on distracted driving. Generally, we're trying to discourage it as much as we can. Uh, but uh, it does seem to be a, a growing issue, uh, uh, especially with cell phone use and things like that. So anyway, um, let me uh, uh, move on. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, so what is MHE is a report available. So most harmful event. So most harmful event is one of the codes. It's in the fatal analysis reporting system that talks, you know, that basically every fatal crash goes into where the most harmful event in the crash is identified. So you might have a first harmful event where a vehicle hit a, hit, hit a curb or something, uh, but then they went on to roll over. So the most harmful event was the rollover. Um, uh, so it's just one of the, the uh, fields in the database that, that we look at. And, and I can't really answer your question, Sarah, on, on uh, you know, if there's research that's been done on specifically on roadway departures. I'm not aware of that at this point. Um, let's see. Now, Adobe Presenter looks like it's trying to start up, uh, but it's not on my screen. Hopefully, I'm not back in the no man's land. Uh, there we go. It doesn't feel like you might be. I, uh, okay. Are you able it's to up. see the it's presentation? A, it's up now. Yeah. OK, perfect. Now, do I have control here? I don't see any you arrows. Should. Uh, I think you need to promote me. Yeah, I'm not a presenter. OK, there we go. OK. OK. So this next part of the uh, webinar, we're going to go into talking about what uh, proven safety countermeasures are to combat, combat rural roadway departures. We're also going to talk about who you might speak to if you want to get more involved with this EDC effort. Uh, so, so the what part of our um, um, question or, or of our presentation deals with widespread systemic deployment of underutilized but proven roadway departure countermeasures. So, uh, 
And when we look at roadway departures, we really try to address them in three main areas. Uh, we try, first off, can we keep the vehicle on the road? Because if we can keep the vehicle on the road, that's our best bet of not having a roadway departure. Um, but we know that we can't always do that. So then we try to reduce the potential for a crash if you do leave the road. Uh, and finally, if we can't have a nice flat roadside uh, without any objects, then we try to minimize the severity of a crash that might occur. Uh, so first off, to keep vehicles on the road, we can do things like improve curve delineation by using chevrons and advanced warning signs to let drivers know that they need to do something coming up to a curve. Um, we can use friction treatments on curves uh, to, to improve the friction, to reduce the chance that you might run off the road, especially in curves where friction demand is high and we tend to, uh, and it tends to wear out faster. And uh, then we also use things like rumble strips to alert a driver that they're starting to leave the road or cross the center line uh, and, and get into a crash. Uh, and, and Keith is going to be going into more detail on the rumble strips in the second half of this webinar. Um, the next uh, area that we have for, for dealing with roadway departures is to reduce the potential for crashes if you do leave the road. You know, that starts out with just having a shoulder in some cases, but, but then we try not to have a drop off at the edge of the pavement. That's where the safety edge comes in. Uh, I think somebody mentioned in one of their crashes uh, where a safety edge probably helped avoid a crash for them. Uh, so that's very good. Um, maintaining, but also uh, maintaining uh, clear roadsides, uh, clear zones, uh, traversable roadside slopes is another area that uh, can, can make an improvement, where, where that can make a difference. And lastly, we look at minimizing the severity. If we know we can't flatten out all our roadsides or we need to have some objects uh, like luminaires or signs on our roadsides, if we can at least make them break away uh, or, uh, or use barrier to shield uh, vehicles from getting to, to those objects. So that's our last area to, to address in roadway departure. Now, some of the things that are going to be offered as part of the EDC offering is we're going to be offering technical assistance in developing local and regional safety action plans, uh, helping on how to do systemic analysis, uh, peer exchanges, also focus groups that uh, look at implementation issues. We also plan to have webinars uh, like this. Uh, we also have existing training, and re we might revise existing training or, or develop new training. We hope to develop more trainers uh, and also by providing the LTAP with resource packages that might help them help their local agencies. Now, if, if you want more information on um, EDC, uh, you can sign up for a newsletters uh, that are that are sent out that will give you more information on this initiative as well as many other, all the other initiatives that are available through EDC. Um, uh, and if you're interested in participating in this particular one, uh, the way the process works is in the next few weeks we're going to be starting a, a round of summits where we're having every state uh, uh, bring people to a summit, and we're going to be talking about what the initiatives are. But it's ultimately up to the states to decide which ones that they're going to engage in. Uh, so if you're interested in this, you might contact your FHWA Division Office Safety Contact, uh, your state uh, DOT Safety Engineer, or your LTAP Center uh, to let them know that you're interested in this initiative. Now uh, we're, we can take a few more questions. I think we might have another poll uh, question. Yep, we absolutely do. So over on the left-hand side, again, is that chat pod. You guys can feel free to put in, a, in any questions. And at this point, we do have a couple more polls for you. The first one is, which of the following are effective at reducing the potential for a vehicle to leave the road? Curve signing, clear zones, barriers, high friction surface treatments, rumble strips, all of the above. None of the above, or I don't know, I don't remember. And then the next one is a true-false question. The three objectives for rural roadway departure are, one, keeping vehicles on the road, two, reducing the potential for crashes, and three, minimizing the severity, uh, true or false. And then the last question is, how can the EDC-5 initiative um, help you? And you can go ahead and freely type in your answer into that response. And we'll give everyone a, a few minutes to go ahead and fill those out. And again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat bottom, pod on the left-hand side. 
and, and definitely uh, letting us know what we can do to help. That's one of the things we're hoping to get out of webinars like this is, you know, we may not have all the answers. We need you to tell us what, what we can do to help you uh, uh, go forward. So I see uh, a lot of people are saying all of the above. So uh, curve signing, clear zones, barriers, high friction surface treatments, rumble strips, all of those uh, have been shown to be very effective um, at uh, reducing the number of people that run off the road. Um, the three objectives for rural road rate departures are keeping vehicles on the road, reducing the potential for crashes, and minimizing severity. Looks like everybody got 100% on that, so very good. Um, some of the, the items that I see coming up uh, uh, in, include uh, identifying low cost, high return ideas. Yeah, we're always looking for the next uh, magic uh, magic answer. Uh, you know, uh, rumble strips have done very well for us. Uh, uh, high friction surface treatments, but you know, what if there's some other idea out there that we're we're always looking for? What that is? Um, information on designing and constructing cable barriers on rural county roads. Yeah, that, that's something that I think is underused. Uh, you know, we have seen uh, usage of them in areas where maybe there's a concern for, vi uh, you know, uh, not wanting a barrier that's uh, uh, maybe ugly and maybe cable barriers. You can see through them. You don't see them as much. Uh, but I, I believe that they are underused on rural county roads. Um, um, so I saw somebody said more money. Um, unfortunately, uh, EDC doesn't have a pot of money to uh, uh, put into it, but uh, there are other fund sources uh, out there. So provide statistics for CMFs of proven countermeasures. Yeah, we have the CMF Clearinghouse uh, that's available, uh, and those are always adding more more CMFs. But uh, we plan on trying to, through training, uh, make people aware of different ones that we think are particularly effective. Okay. Uh, so, so again, thank you for all your input. You do have um, one question over in the chat pod. Is there any information about clear zones increasing speeds? Um, that, that is also something I think needs to be looked into because uh, on the inverse of that is some people think that if we decrease the clear zone, maybe we're going to decrease speeds through traffic calming, and maybe that has been shown to work a little bit in some areas. But I, I, I think that uh, there, that's that's a, a question, a good question that needs to be looked at more. I did recently see something uh, that was done in Alaska where they found a reduction of uh, uh, moose crashes, where they done clearing and grubbing, where you know they were basically clearing things out. I think for visibility of the moose, uh, uh, but uh, uh, and they found that there was some reduction in, in those types of crashes. But I do think that more research is needed in that area. And then for the gentleman who was asking about the FARS data, um, Tori Brinkley from FHWA Resource Center did put some information about the FARS database link in the chat pod as well. OK, and thank you, Dick. Um, at okay. this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Keith. And sorry for the technical difficulties. I'm not sure what happened there, but hopefully we got through them. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks everybody, and good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, I'm Keith Knapp. I'm the Iowa LTAP director. Uh, I guess I'd also respond to the clear zones. Besides that, that's going to be one of the subjects, again, uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, webinar two or three, I forget which one it is, the clear zones is going to be discussed in that. And, of course, what we're focused on here is rural, uh, which is high speed. And so there's going to be kind of a difference there with regard to, what's acceptable when you talk about a clear zone uh, between lower speed and higher speed. So I'll just throw that out there. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about rumble strips and rumble stripes. Uh, Dick mentioned again we have a lot of uh, countermeasures to try to keep people on or keep vehicles on the roadway and rumble strips and rumble stripes is one of the proven safety countermeasures. To do that, um, there's a number of others, which again will be subjects, uh, like I mentioned, clear zone and uh, high friction is going to be on some of the webinars that will follow here. Excuse me. Uh, so rumble stripes or rumble strips, and I'll explain the difference between those two. It's a ter I use the rumble strip uh, term for uh, pavement markings on top of a rumble stripe, and again, it, however you want to refer to it. 
Uh, but basically what we're trying to do is put together a countermeasure to keep people on the roadway, particularly those inattentive drivers, the distracted or drowsy driver. And the interesting thing there, of course, is it takes a different level of attention getting for a distracted driver versus a drowsy driver because one is falling asleep and might need a little more noise. Uh, in addition, rumble strips or stripes uh, can, of course, help. Uh, what we found is can help people when it's snow covered or whatnot. We've had people say, yep, you know, it helps me keep my proper lane placement. Uh, so again, just a little bit of a, an additional benefit. There are a number of different locations for rumble stripes, or snow strips, I should say, or rumbles. Let's just refer to them as rumbles. It'd be easier that way. Uh, there's the shoulder and the edge line. And like I mentioned, I've Edge line combined with the rumble strip, I call that a rumble stripe. And so it's edge line over the rumble stripe. We'll talk a little bit, a couple of slides on how that might enhance uh, some of their uh, impacts. And then of course you have center line, rumble stripes. Number of different types of rumbles. In the past, a number of these things were rolled in. And again, I, my background is in highway design and safety. Uh, not so much in construction, but they were rolled in. This has essentially become obsolete. Uh, there were some construction issues, uniformity issues. Uh, so for the most part, everything's kind of milled in at this point using a, a milling machine. Uh, and you can see an example of that here. Some of the other states, some states do use raised uh, rumble strips. Uh, and uh, yeah, the buttons are here. There's other versions of these. Uh, we don't tend to see these in Iowa because we plow snow. And so those don't survive very long when it comes to snow plowing. Another thing that is used uh, is this profiled pavement markings. Uh, again, the impacts of that, this thermoplastic tape, they might they enhance, can enhance visibility, create a little bit of a rumble. They're very narrow. Uh, their impacts safety-wise and everything, and because there's different types of designs there, uh, aren't really known, uh, and there's a lot of different versions out there. Uh, of course, again, plowing would be an issue with this because, again, you're going to plow that type of stuff up when you do plow. There is a number of, a uh, large number, a uh, big number of guidance out there with regard to rumble strips and stripes. These are not new. This is not, not new. It's been around for decades. Uh, I think one thing I read said they've been around at least 50 years. Uh, no doubt they've been increasing in usage. Uh, Federal Highways put out a technical advisory uh, in 2011, and that essentially includes things on background, application, design, that kind of thing, uh, uh, effectiveness, uh, at least in 2011. And of course, some things have happened since then, which we'll talk about also today when we talk about safety impacts. Um, maybe some of you, maybe all of you have heard about NCHRP 500. Uh, there's a series of these, I think there's over 20 of NCHRP Report 500 that address different types of collisions. This one here for runoff the road, addressing runoff the road collisions has been around about 15 years now. Uh, but in 2009, 2010, NCHRP 641 came out. That's guidance on the design and application of shoulder and centerline rumble strips. This also has some great safety impact analysis in it. I consider it a seminal document when it comes to rumble stripes and rumble strips, or rumble stripes, I guess, at that point. Uh, again, that's, om that's almost 10 years old at this point, but still very relevant, great work. Uh, you also have the Highway Safety Manual, which does have, we'll mention that. I've got one slide that has some information on centerline rumble strips uh, from the Highway Safety Manual. These two documents, NCHRP 641 and the Highway Safety Manual, kind of crossed in their publication. So while 641 came out shortly before HSM came out, they were already in publication for HSM, and so it didn't make it into the Highway Safety Manual. So I'll show you kind of the differences between what's in the Highway Safety Manual uh, and what's in 641 with regard to centerline rumble strips. This all leads to, and again, the place to go, uh, Besides, in addition to the crash modification clearinghouse, which um, uh, Dick mentioned, Federal Highway website. You can see the address above there. Lots and lots of great information on this website. Proven safety countermeasure, general information, safety information, design information, accommodating users, noise, pavement, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about. Uh, I'll mention a couple other reports at the end here because most recently in the last 
couple of years, uh, a decision support guide came out and a state, state of practice document came out. And so there's all kinds of information available in addition to, and I'll mention these as we move into the issue discussion, implementation guides, implementation fact, fact sheets. It's a great resource. I encourage people to use it. We're, we're just doing this brief overview today. There's all kinds of detail in there that you should take advantage of. So we're moving right into the safety of discussion. Uh, so shoulder rumble strips, crash reduction factors. This is, comes out of NCHRP 641 again on rural freeways. You see an 11% reduction and a 16% reduction in single vehicle run off the road crashes and single vehicle run off the road fatality and injury crashes. That's certainly a significant amount, nothing to be sneezed at. On rural two-lane roadways, those numbers go up. And so again, single vehicle run off the road and single vehicle run off the road fatalities. So these are, these, again, these are quite large. And again, we're not, most of the discussion that's happening with regards to rumble strips now isn't really about safety. This is a proven safety countermeasure. It's mostly about everything that comes along with it when you're installing these kind of things. And we will talk again briefly about some of the issues connected to them. One way that has been used to kind of enhance the shoulder rumble is to do a mess stripes, which is again the edge line on the pavement marking. And I'm going to emphasize here that two lines, two edge lines is not MUTC compliant, MUTCD compliant. You only can have one edge line. This is for comparison purposes only. Uh, but the point here is you can see the, the better reflection on the rumble stripe than on the normal edge line in the rain. And this has to do with, again, that vertical face and the fact that you're painting that, and that tends to be a little, that stays bright, essentially, which is a, a great thing. Uh, so they, it enhances visibility, uh, and that may have impacts on safety improvements. The other thing, of course, it might do or could do is durability. Traffic's not traveling as much on it. You've got rumbles in it. So again, this is after one winter. Again, not MUTC compliant. Do not do this. One edge line is the way you want to go. Uh, the point here, again, is you can also enhance durability. Both of these, of course, could also have safety impacts, which, again, is a good thing. Moving on to centerline rumble strips, you've got that tech advisory. You've got another NCHRP 500 report that focuses solely on head-on collisions, which is one of the target crashes of centerline rumble strips, uh, and we have some impacts. Now, this table comes out of the Highway Safety Manual, and if you look over on the right, they talk about what a, a crash modification factor. There is a crash, modifi crash modification factor clearinghouse. I think, in fact, I think the website address is cmfclearinghouse.org, maybe. Uh, very easy to get to, lots of information. In fact, can be somewhat overwhelming. You have to match up what you're doing out in the real world with what you're looking at in the CMF Clearinghouse, and there's lots of guidance on how to do that. In this case, and there's a relationship between CMFs and crash reduction factors. So if you look over on the right, you can see for our installing centerline rumble strips on a rural two-lane roadway, what the Highway Safety Manual says, and again, remember 641 hadn't been incorporated into this. Uh, 0.86 for all types of crashes, 0.85 for all types of crash injury crashes, 0.79 for head-on. What that essentially means is for all types of crashes, you're talking about 15, you know, 14 to 15%, right, uh, for a crash reduction factor. Uh, the given situation, is, again, is no center line. If you were to install a center line, what the Highway Safety Manual says is it predicted that you're going to have these kind of reductions. When you look at just the target crashes, which is head-on, and opposing direction sideswipe crashes, it jumps up, right, to 21%, 25%. So that's not surprising because that's what we're targeting with centerline rumble strips. Now, if we move to 641, we've got a little urban, even though we're not talking so much urban today, and rural two-lane with regard to centerline rumble strips. And again, these are, in the safety world, when I see percentages that are double digits, you know, I get excited because I'm a safety guy and these are big numbers. So in the urban area, with the, just the target crashes, you're at that 40 and 65%. You've got some high standard error there. But in the rural two-lane, again, that goes down, and you've got total overall crashes and 
fatal injury crashes of 9 and 12 percent there, and then you jump up again for those target crashes of head-on and opposite direction sideswipe, and you're up in the 30 and 45 percent reductions. Whether this gets in, incorporated or how it gets incorporated into the highway safety manual that's currently being updated, in fact, I think they're writing it right now, if I recall, I don't know when it's going to be out, but I suspect it will because it, it is really good, it's for good research. Uh, there's, pro there's been some stuff done since then, so I, I would guess all the people doing that are going to incorporate all that into it. Now, there's different ways of placing centerline rumble strips, too, of course. You can mill across that joint. We'll talk a little bit about pavement later. Uh, you can split them up to try to avoid that joint. That doesn't happen a lot. And of course, you're taking area away. And you've got this variable spacing. So there's other designs. What I'd encourage everybody here to do is find out what your spec is in your, in your state. Because again, rumble strips are not new. I suspect all, I'm going to say maybe all states, have some kind of rumble strip specification. And so there likely is a design in your state. And I would encourage you to search that out. So there are combination issues that go on too. And again, remember, we're just talking about safety benefits at this time or safety impacts. Uh, it mentions this bike friendly, and we will talk about those gaps and that what's in the fact sheets and things like that with regard to allowing bikes in and out and that kind of thing. But there has been some work in the safety impacts of the combination of the centerline strip and the shoulder rumble. And I wanted to bring that up because it's pretty new. It's only three years old at this point. Uh, so there was a study, again, available. I'm going to say it's available on the Federal Highway website, but for sure, in fact, that's probably where I found it. So, uh, but it's certainly available. And they looked at this combination and found crash modification factors of for total and injury crashes of that 0.8 and 0.77, so that 20 to 23 percent reduction, and then head on and side swipe opposite direction, which is your target of 0.7, which is a 30 percent crash reduction factor. So what they concluded was these results suggest that combining these things will reduce, will further reduce run off the road crashes in comparison to just shoulder rumble strips. So whether or how that makes it into, again, the new highway safety manual, I don't know. It may also be, uh, of course, uh, in, I'm, I haven't looked, but it's probably on, in the CMF clearinghouse, too. If it isn't there, we need to let those folks know so that it should be in there, because it's several years old at this point. So we have a poll question about what I just talked about, and certainly we can answer some of the questions that have been coming up in the chat pod. We'll take some time here. We do. So for anyone else who has questions, you can put those in the chat pod over on the left-hand side. Um, Keith did also mention the CMF Clearinghouse. I posted the link for that in the chat pod if you scroll up just a bit. And then also the, the previous document that he was talking about, I did post a link for that as well in the chat pod for anyone who was interested in that. So our poll question for you that we have now is which of these crash types are typically defined as the target crashes for centerline rumble strips? Select all that apply. Single vehicle run off the road crashes, head on crashes, opposite direction side swipe crashes, fixed object crashes, or I don't know, I don't remember. We'll just give you a few seconds to go ahead and fill that out. So do we want to answer some of these other questions? Um, I actually think you're all set with the poll question. It looked like just about everyone oh. was done. So I've gone ahead okay. and closed that and broadcast the results for you. So this is somewhat of a trick question because it's just focusing on centerline rumbles and just on the target crashes, which I defined verbally <laughs> as single vehicle run off the road and, uh, no, sorry, head-on crashes and opposite direction side swipe. That's the difference between target and total uh, when it comes to that research and how that research is presented. Uh, so the target, the, the correct answer is head-on and opposite. Okay, perfect. So the first question that we have for you in the chat pod is, have noise complaints been an issue from residents on the rural roads where the rumbles are located? Short answer, yes. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that because the next section is on issues. And if, if your question isn't answered or you need more information, 
uh, go ahead and ask. And the next question is, is there any research on if and how centerline rumble strips cause drivers to give less space when passing bicyclists on roads with narrow or no shoulders? Right, and so um, any research on if or how drivers cause drivers to give less space when passing with that? So um, interesting enough, I'm going to get into, of course, bike discussions. Uh, I don't specifically address this, but of course, the implementation guide that I'm going to give you the link for does. And I'll, I'll just read one paragraph out of the bike uh, rumble strip implementation guide that addresses bicycle issues on two-lane roadways um, as quickly as I can. And again, I encourage everybody to go out and look at state, all this information in the state of the practice. Another concern I'm reading now, another concern is that motorists are less likely to cross the center line to pass a bicycle at the edge of the lane or in the shoulder if there's a rumble strip on that center line. Michigan DOT conducted a field study that found 71% of drivers contacted the center line rumble to pass a bicycle in comparison to 79% of the drivers that contacted that center line where there was no rumble strip present, which essentially means an 8% difference. However, the effect of the present of the rumble strip was small in comparison to the location of the bicyclist in the travel lane or on the shoulder and whether there was an oncoming, oncoming traffic in the opposing lane. So that's the whole paragraph in there. Uh, there is guidance uh, from AASHTO about how wide you want lanes to be to, you know, for sharing a car and a bicycle. Uh, there's guidance on shoulder width beyond the uh, rumble. Uh, which, again, we can talk more about if you want. Uh, it's in, again, the bike guide, actually I'll, the guide for the development of bike facilities. Uh, most likely, again, there's specs on these in your state. So take a look at that. So that's, that's just out of the, the info guide there. Uh, what's next? The next question is the meaning of TOT and FI target crashes? Total and um, fatal injury. Um, and the next one is, what is a cost-effective method of installing rumble strips in older asphalt pavement and the cost per foot or mile? I don't have an answer for you. That sounds like something that maybe someone else could find. Um, I don't have an answer off the top of my head about the cost of installing rumble strips. And again, older pavement, we'll talk about pavement and kind of what has been found with regard to pavements. Uh, and what they suggest. And there's, again, a whole, excuse me, I gotta take a drink of water here. There's a whole implementation guide that focuses solely on pavements that's on, on the FHWA website. This is, these are brand new implementation guides and fact sheets. They're one or two years old, a couple years old, I think. Looks like uh, there was also, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. Go there ahead. was also a question in there about providing a link for the EDC newsletter, and that has been provided in the chat pod. Um, and the last question it looks like for you, Keith, is what is the rationale for placing rumble strips to the outside of the edge line as opposed to on the edge line? So the edge line stripe, I would say, just based on my experience, and again, maybe Dick and others can chime in here, is the stripe is a newer idea, and by newer I mean a decade old or something like that, of something that's being done more regularly now. Um, there's always going to be trade-offs. We'll talk about that again coming up with the issues. You put something closer to the roadway, it's going to be hit by cars more often. If noise is an issue, then there might be a trade-off you have to do, you see. So it's, there's, there's the incidental hits, and then there's the hits that we really want, right, that save people's lives. So I will talk a little bit about that. Um, the example I always use is I live about a half a mile away from a four-lane divided access control roadway, 65 miles an hour. Uh, there's buildings between me and there. I don't even face the roadway. Um, I, at night, I'm doing what I do, and my windows are closed, and I hear rumble, I hear uh, shoulder rumble hits. I, of course, have a different opinion of that. I think of it and go, oh, somebody's life just got saved. That's the way I look at it. Maybe others will have a different, <laughs> different, uh, different um, response to that, especially if they're closer to the roadway. But that's, of course, the way I think. Uh, if those shoulder rumble, if those shoulder rumbles were even closer, and this is not a tight curve that I on the 65 mile an hour roadway, those shump, those rumbles were closer to that edge line, they'd be hitting them more. Uh, so that's 
that's one of the trade-offs. Moving on, yes? Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. I have the presentation all set up for you. Okay. So moving on to issues, and again, we're going to be going through a few of these issues. There's no li there's likely more. We could have entire half hour, hour and a half just on in each individual issue. Again, I'd encourage you to read the documentation that's available and kind of anyway, we'll move on and I'll make a couple of points here. So some of the issues that do come up, bicycles, of course, motorcycles, a little bit now, not so much as before. Pavement, let's just say condition comes up, uh, thickness type, and of course noise. So some of the issues, a lot of the issues, again, with bikes have to do with is there rideable space? And so you, is it going to restrict the use of the shoulder uh, paved uh, that uh, is available for bike use? Is there the, or is it going to be like this? Or is it going to be like this and cause people to do things uh, differently? So is there that minimum shoulder width? And again, I refer you back to the specs and the guidance. Guidance Ashto would say four and five feet to the right of a shoulder. It depends on, again, the situation. And uh, I, again, at the DOT, they might have guidance in your, at your DOT. That's the AASHTO guidance that I mentioned with the four and the five feet. Can they be placed on the edge line? Again, now we're talking about bikes now. Again, there's trade-offs like I was talking about just previously. But, you know, if you move this rumble on the bottom right there out to the shoulder or to the edge line, you have more space on the shoulder, more people hit it, more noise. There's trade-offs involved with all of this. And that's, that's kind of the point I'll be making as we talk about issues. And some of these trade-offs, we know their impacts and some we don't from a safety point of view. So there are these implementation fact sheets and guides. I found these great. Um, they've been around since about late 2015, 2016. Uh, there's one on bikes. It includes, again, an intro and basics. And then it talks rideable space, traversing rumble strips, collaborating with your bike your, your local bike groups and outreach and that kind of thing. What I came away with from these three guides that I have looked at and we're going to talk about a bit uh, is it's case by case. Flexibility is good, but there's going to be trade-offs. And the trade-off word will happen again and again. But I'm not, you know, this, this, this goes right along the way I've always done engineering, which is you look at a case and you determine if that works there and it doesn't, then you figure out what's going to work and what you need to do by talking to people and moving on in that manner. manner. And I think that, to me, that's what these emphasize. In the design area, the fact sheet and the guide, fact sheet particularly talks about three things, gaps, offset, and size. And again, design is my kind of area, so we'll talk about that. The gaps here, again, every 40 to 60 feet, 10 to 12 feet long, whatnot, depends on what your spec is, allows, allows bikes to get in and out. The use of edge line, someone brought that up. Again, I brought up the fact the offset part, right? So this one could be an edge line rumble strip. You also have that joint there, which involves payment issues. And then you have noise and where you are. So you see where we're going with all this. There are factors that need to be considered case by case. We do know that consistently continuous rumble strips are better than lots and lots of breakups. Okay? Uh, so that's just the way it works. Because we don't know where people are going to go off that road except some very specific spots they do more often. Reducing length, and again, in this case, just so everybody's kind of aware of this, with regard to rumble strips, length is measured perpendicular to the, tra the, 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 the way the traffic travel, okay? So it's what, we, what I typically refer to the width is the length, really. So 16 to 12 or whatnot, again, there's different specs for that. I've seen smaller ones than that also, and depth. 5 eighths, 4 eighths, half an inch, 3 eighths. And recall what I mentioned, though. These are very fine line changes we're making. Uh, to determine their impacts on safety is not something we really know a lot about. We know what impacts noise in the car and rumbles. These are very fine lines we're drawing here. So will they have a safety impact? They may. And so there's your trade-off again. Because the primary objective here is to keep people on the roadway and reduce crashes. Motorcycles has come up in the past. Um, maybe it's this Minnesota DOT study that's kind of squashed a lot of that discussion. Uh, what they did uh, a number of years ago, it looks like 2008, 
um, is look at crash history, 44 hours of video online, uh, and then observed uh, them riding this course here, which is up in Minnesota. They didn't find anybody, didn't find any reference to the center and rumor strip uh, out of almost 10,000 motorcycle crash reports. When they looked at the hours of observation, small number of crossings, no, in, no instances again of directional change or inhibiting of the passing. On the closed course, when they talked to the guys, or the people I should say, um, the riders pretty much said, yep, yeah, you know what, we're good. We, you know, we're not, we're not changing the way we do stuff. Uh, and so it, it supported what they were seeing in the crash reports and the observation in the field. So their conclusion, these researchers, was pretty much no indication that center line rumbles posed a hazard to, to motorcycles. And I haven't heard someone bring that up on any emphatic way for quite some time. Moving on to pavement, again, another implementation guide, another fact sheet. Uh, they talk about characteristics. We'll talk a little bit about that, longitudinal joint location. So I'm not a pavements guy, but there's probably some people online that are. Um, rumble types and maintenance. We'll talk about a few things that I've heard people ask about uh, when we do this as part of uh, the local roadside safety uh, training that we've done in the past. By the way, I also wanted to mention is that we just recently updated the low-cost safety improvements course. Uh, and uh, lots of stuff on keeping vehicles on the roadway and CMX. So the fact sheet talks about suitability and the use of rumbles. Here's what, that, here's what they say. It's milled into new and existing asphalt and Portland cement concrete, little or no accelerated deterioration if you've got fair to better rankings or ratings of your pavement, which again, the pavement guys will know about. Um, I come away with if it's good pavement, you're good to go. If it's bad pavement, there's probably other issues you have to deal with before you start putting rumbles in. Uh, most states have a minimum thickness. That's right there in the guide and in the fact sheet. Uh, some examples of that. You want the overlay thickness typically to exceed that rumble strip depth. Microsurfacing, ultra thin, you just have to think about delamination. You get, get water in the layers and they freeze and thaw. It can cause issues. So you need to think about how how things are going to happen with your situation uh, to reduce that delamination with chip, you know, chip seals are applied after the rumble installation, and it depends, on, again, on your situation as to whether chip sealing is needed or not. And we'll, i got one slide on that where people are kind of doing both right into chip seals. On joints, same kind of thing. There have been concerns in the past. Again, I've heard about these concerns for well over a decade. Uh, what they're saying at this point is a good to fair rating not going to be accelerated deterioration, but they do suggest some ways to avoid joints. Again, you mill those two smaller rumbles on each side, but that takes more space and could have impacts. Offset that rumble strip. Again, think about the trade-offs there. Now you're offsetting it to get away from the shoulder joint, but you're pushing it into a shoulder where there might be bikes. So it's all about the situation. And then offsetting that center line joint, there's actually kind of a Bit of a design to get a better kind of joint, uh, what I'd call a lap, which other people call notch joints. It's just to help with the compaction and have good joints. So again, conclusion, good joints, normal strips are, will be just fine. You have something, you have some not so good stuff, you could have problems. So do this on good, good pavement and not really bad pavement because it's not going to help. It's going to help, might help safety, but your pavement's going to possibly degrade. Fog seals, without getting into kind of what that is, sealing things up. A lot of states used to require this when they milled into older pavements. A lot of states are saying no longer needed, uh, primarily because we just haven't seen any impact on pavement life. Again, if you follow that guidance, um, and again, fog seals and thermoplastic tape doesn't work well together. Not really my area of expertise, but I, it makes sense to me. We only got 10 minutes here. So chip seals, again, you see the Michigan example and the Washington example. I would encourage you to read the, the guidance that's out there. Uh, think about layers and delamination and how far you're going down and what you want to do and what potential impacts are out there. Uh, depends on the situation. Getting into noise. I know I'm going quickly. I apologize for that. I just want to leave some time open for some questions here. Um, Lots of information on the noise fact sheet. That's good to go. And we'll talk about placement and design variations and kind of the basics of design. 
uh, or noise, I should say, in this case, to kind of give everybody an idea of where we stand on this situation. Noise and vibration is a good thing to rouse people, um, drowsy and distracted. That's kind of the whole point of rumble strips. The sound inside that vehicle, again, when we're playing with widths and lengths and depths and everything, higher speeds, you're going to have higher, you know, higher noise inside, shallower departure angle. So how people go off the roadway, if you go at a shallow angle, you're going to hit that width of that uh, rumble strip more. It's going to increase that noise. If it's on the driver's side versus the Passenger side is going to be the type of vehicle you want, the spacing, the depth, the width, the length. These fine segment segmentations, though, is stuff that really hasn't been studied much. But, but certainly, as professionals, we can make some conclusions if we start changing these things. So more, more noise is better for the driver, not so great for some people around residents and businesses. There's also this character thing, especially in a rural area. Uh, I live kind of on an edge of a small town. Well, small town. 50,000 people um, amongst the neighborhood, and certainly I hear it. Uh, it's just something you don't really think about much. Uh, so complaints can be received. There is some in the guidance and the fact sheet again, or the implementation guide, uh, and statement of work, no doubt. Uh, there are places that do discontinue use in particular areas, some states, and there's some examples in there. Suburban rather than rural, driveway densities of certain types, curve radius of certain types. These are places where noise could be an issue. Uh, and it's just, again, it's a decision to be made. So let's look at curves and intersections a little bit on that. Um, this is where attention to detail is important, and there's also these trade-offs. They talk about considering widening the pavement on horizontal curves to, you know, because of the incidental hits. Uh, although incident, you know, incidental, you keep people on the pavement. Using a spiral design, which again, we can get into designs of curves, but spiral design versus kind of just the simple radius. The center lane rumbles, we you know, wider, turn, wider travel lane. Widening the median, if you will, wider, the center lines are wider, but again, you're pushing traffic away from that center line, and that could have impacts. Same thing with the edge line or shoulder rumbles, using a greater offset has that trade off with bicycles, right? So. Keep bringing the word, the word up. I don't know what other word to use. At intersection major driveways, typically, again, they're going to be discontinued because you're going to have turning traffic and slowing traffic and things like that. And those are incidental hits versus uh, uh, hits that avoid crashes. Design and flexibility, change the offset on the rumble strip, potential bike impacts, adjust the depth. A couple of states that are mentioned in the guide use a 3 8 versus a 4 8 or a 5 8 its impact on safety. Now again, these are only in particular places, right? So they've had this discussion and they've decided that's acceptable in those states. Adjusting the spacing, some people are experimenting with that. That's the spacing between the rumbles. Uh, and so that's still being looked at. Finally, just kind of wrap everything up here. There is this, what I call a mumble strip out there. This is the sinusoidal shape. That report and its impacts out of Minnesota that I'm going to mention in the next slide um, is on the Federal Highway website. So if you're interested in that, I say new. Seems like Europe's been looking at it for a little bit. I kind of come away with it as a researcher of we're still kind of early on. There's still some, let's say, conflicting results or results that aren't matching up quite right. Uh, so it's kind of this new idea. There's preliminary results that show reduction in external noise. What I want to know is what's the safety impact, and those have yet to be determined. So. There is this new idea out there that's just a different kind of shape to try to reduce noise, and we're still waiting on, there's just probably not enough out there to study the safety benefits. But there has been a couple of projects that have been going on. Uh, the Minnesota one is finished. I don't know about the California one, uh, but these are some things. Last thing, two really great documents. Uh, I haven't had, even had a chance to read the statement of practice yet. I believe it's 150 pages plus, but you have this decision, the SPARC guide that came out a couple of years ago, and the basis of that is a statement of practice. It came out last year. There's your website addresses. Use them for what they're worth. They're available on the Federal Highway website and uh, will help you with implementation. Poll question uh, and other questions. We're now, we now have six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we do. So I'm going to put up the poll break and let everyone go ahead and fill that out um, at your leisure. 
let you guys read that one on your own, and we'll go ahead and jump to some of these questions, um, Keith, for you. Um, the first one is, as more and more newer vehicles have lane departure warning systems, will rumbles become obsolete? I have no idea. <laughs> um, and, and, and I did try to answer that one in the poll, uh, in, the, in the chat pod. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we get to a point where no vehicles are running off the road, then yeah, rumble strips probably <laughs> won't make any difference anymore. But I don't think we've seen the evidence that, that, that that's happened yet. There, there are still are crashes that involve automated vehicles that run off the road. Uh, and then it's a matter of when do we get the whole fleet of all the vehicles that are out there equipped with equipment with with the technology that's going to do that. Um, I've, I have seen studies uh, that looked at effectiveness of modern, you know, newer vehicles that have some of the technology. And in some cases, people can turn those things off if they if they don't feel like they're if they're beeping too much or things like that. So I, I think we need to see that those technologies are effective before we. Uh, before we hang up the, uh, you know, before we retire rumble strips. And I think that's a ways down the road. And I, I guess I would also say, of course, we also have to think about the infrastructure that's out there that these things interact with. And if they're going off of lane marking and you're in a rural area, you may or may not have those. So there's a lot of discussion about um, how long it's going to take for this to impact rural areas versus urban areas. And I'll admit it, I'm guilty. I've I've turned off my lane departure on my new car uh, because it's gone off too much. Uh, I believe it was in a winter storm, and every time I hit something, it was it was going off constantly because we were trying to center ourselves in the in the full the full roadway because it was really coming down. And so, yeah, it's uh, it was one of those things where we were being safe, but it was going off so much uh, that I turned it off. And I you know, and I've had errors on my even on the one I've got. Uh, where it's detecting a lighter pavement as a as a lane marking, uh, which isn't actually the lane marking, and it's going off. So along with my collision avoidance, I've had errors on that too. So soon, we'll see, it's going fast. What else do we have here? Um, someone asked for the, the links for those two last publications posted. I did post them. Um, Someone else mentioned that rumble strips have saved uh, their life on a motorcycle. Mm. And cool. I believe that might have been the last question for you. So it looks like you can go ahead and address the poll question, and we'll wrap up the webinar. OK. So looks like everybody 100%. Um, and it's just I, I didn't include the motorcycle one. Um, so all of the above is correct. Bikes, pavements, noise. There's likely other things that come up. Uh, and we do the best we can. So thanks, everybody. Um, I just wanted to mention, someone's mentioning that, that the, the first link that I just posted doesn't work, and that's true. Um, both of the links went together, uh, and so they did not work. So I reposted them separately, and those two, um, the last two should be working at this point in time. Okay, so in this webinar, we hope you have learned to summarize the safety problem connected to rural roadway departures, to describe the approaches to reducing rural roadway departures, to identify proven safety countermeasures to combat rural roadway departures, to list who to speak with in your state to show your support for joining the EDC-5 innovation, to describe the potential safety-related benefits of rumble strips and rumble stripes, and to identify some of the issues to consider before implementation. Uh, we did want to mention that we do have some upcoming webinars. Uh, we are hosting another webinar here in October. It will be on the 23rd, and that will be on the Rural Aging Road User. So we'd love to have all of you there. As we mentioned, this particular one is the first one in a three-part series. We will be hosting part two, which will talk about roadway curve marking and signing and high friction surface treatments. That will occur on November 13th at 11 a.m. Mountain. And we will also have the third part on rural roadway departure countermeasures that we'll talk about clear zone treatments and roadside hardware, and that one will occur on Thursday, December 20th, also at 11 a.m. Mountain. So we'd love to have you at all of those. 
And then I wanted to make sure everyone knows as well that the second National Summit on Rural Road Safety will be happening on December 4th through the 6th in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, the actual summit is on the 5th and 6th. And then the day before that, we will have um, a few workshops that are available. So please take a look at our website to sign up for the Safety Summit. And then I do want to thank both Dick and Keith again for taking the time to present today. Um, and if you do have any further questions for them, their email addresses are here on the screen. And I do just want to remind you again as well, if you were interested in having your state participate in the EDC-5 Innovation on Rural Roadway Departures, um, that you can go ahead and, and talk to those people that Dick li listed um, earlier and also sign up for the EDC-5 news um, letter so that you can get additional information as that is available. One more time, the handouts are available on the bottom left-hand corner. That provides the links for today's webinar and all the resources that they talked about, as well as those links for who to talk to about EDC-5. Um, and there is the EDC-5 fact sheet on the bottom left-hand corner as well. So one more time, thank you, Dick and Keith, for uh, presenting today. We do appreciate it. And everyone have a great day. Great. Thanks. Thanks.